Um, yeah, so I did some Pell a few years ago and I switched to Ruby in 2005 or 2006 and have been done Ruby professionally exclusively since then. So I've been out of the Pell community for the last 10 years. And I've been doing Ruby a lot and I, in the last years I became a member of the Rails core team. So, uh, I'm a, my profile nowadays is the, the profile of a Ruby guy, and I was interviewed recently. Um, given that context, and I was asked about my references and my mentors. And uh, I thought about it for a while, and looking back, I've been doing uh, programming for 15 years professionally, and realized that um, my main uh, source of inspiration and who I admire, uh, uh, who fundamentally shaped the developer I am today, was the Pell community. And um, I would like uh, to go through that journey with you today. Um, it all started in 2000. In 2000, I got my first programming job. It was a, uh, in a Java-based company doing Java. And, well, uh, I, I had been always a, a curious guy about programming languages, but at that time, I have read a little bit of everything, a little bit of C++, of C, Common Lisp, Mathematica, uh, I don't know, Prolog, you know, a, a, little, a little bit of everything, but for some reason, uh, the scripting languages didn't pass through my radar. So I, I saw the, the Yama book in a table in that company and got it and started reading. And there was something in the Yama book that for me represented a turning point for, uh, personally. It was a diamond operator. Um, in, in those days, at least, I don't know how Java programs work nowadays, but in those days, to read from a standard input, you had to do that, okay? So you have this, this system thing, system in, that you pass to an input string reader, then you get an object that you pass to a constructor of a buffer reader that finally is a standard in. And this is doing nothing with the arguments of the program, okay? This is just a standard input. It was fine for me. I, I didn't feel the pain because I was not aware that you could have a convenience layer on top of that. That was the API, that was what you formally had to do. Uh, but man, look at this beauty. I, I mean, when I saw this, I was, it was an inflection point for me. And to understand why, uh, we have to go a little back in time. As many of you, I, I started doing programming as a kid on my own. This, this was the computer where I learned to, to program in BASIC. It's, it was a Triumph Adler Alphatronic. It had only two uh, floppy units, no hard disk. And I had like a magazine or something that has a, a course of, uh, about BASIC. And it was like 12 years old or 13 years old, something like that. And on my own, you know, I learned a little, bit, a little bit of basic with this computer. Later on, I had an Amstrad at home. It was the time of Commodore 64, um, uh, you know, Spectrums. Um, but it was, it, was a, it was a disconnected time. Uh, I have a, a daughter, I, she's 11 years old. And I believe that it's going to be difficult for me to explain to her how was the society before internet. It was disconnected. I was a kid, you know, 12 years old, something like that, in Spain uh, with this phone, and I couldn't improve much. Um, you got a user manual of the computer that explained to you how to operate the computer. But I saw in magazines listing with PIC and POKE and some strange codes, and I had no idea how to learn to do that. And, and that was it. Indeed, I, I dropped it out of high school. So when I was in high school, 
being 17 years old. I had no particular interest in, in school. I felt I was there just for inertia. It was what, you know, all the kids did, and I didn't feel consistent being there. Actually, I was interested in girls, you know, and other things that at that age is what you are thinking of. I mean, at least uh, a guy like me. All right. So I dropped off of school. I did some things for four years, and then I went back to school, studied with a different mindset more seriously. And um, when the time arrived to go to university, um, I had two choices. One choice was, one possibility was to do computer science. And that was linked to my early days doing programming. And the other thing was that when I studied seriously uh, in the last years before your time for, doing, for going to the university, I discovered that I loved mathematics. Not the mathematics, you know, in the school, because the mathematics in the school um, are kind of, look, they, 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 they feel like closed, I don't know. But I read some history books on mathematics and I was blown away by what I read. And I decided that that was what I wanted to do. So I went to the Faculty of Mathematics in the University of Barcelona. I did the degree and I did one year of PhD. And those were possibly the best years in my life. I had a blast, but uh, once uh, I was doing the PhD, I was 30 years old by then. And um, I decided I wanted to switch gears again. And having a blast doing that thing, I had a personal urgency to solve real problems, to solve actual problems. Because if you do pure maths, uh, for, I don't know, six, seven years, whatever. Um, you de your day-to-day -day is, you know, theorem, demonstration, exercise, corollary, generalization of you know, things. Everything is abstract, okay? Everything is logical, everything is abstract. It's very intuitive, it's very creative. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and at the same time, very rigorous. I don't know, I love it. But uh, you are always on the blackboard. I needed to do real things. So. Uh, this is a strip that I love, where, you know, soci sociology is just applied, psychology, psychology is just applied, biology, the, uh, this guy says, but then the chemists say that biology is just applied, chemistry, which the physicists believe is just applied physics. And then you see this gap, there, there's the mathematician all, that say, oh, hey, I didn't see you guys all the way over there. So that's the, you know, fields arranged by purity. So I had an urgency to, to, to switch to the real things and then it was my time to do computer programming. So all this context is what's in this slide. So I saw here a tool to solve problems. Indeed, you know these, these heavy hammers that you can use to demolish walls. So that's, that's what Bell uh, fell to me, you know, when I discovered it was, give me a problem, apply Pell, next problem, all right? <laughs> so I started using Pell, and at that time, I am starting working professionally. I was an amateur, you know, you, you, you formally read some you know, I don't know, the hyper-spec or whatever, but uh, I, I, I hadn't done very much, you know, serious, actually, uh, professional programming. And I was started, and this g gave me exposure to a number of things in, that I believe either are unique to Pell or are, like, a strong characteristics of, of Pell. And um, that changed the way uh, I, I, I program uh, for, for I, I believe, for my life, all right? One of them was pragmatism. Pragmatism. If, if I had to highlight one of the, one, one of the most um, uh, significant characteristics of the Pell culture, I would choose pragmatism. Pragmatism is, dif is difficult to do. 
you have to have a, a practical mind and you have to have um, one of those um, trademarks of seasoned developers that in my experience are very difficult to find which is the ability to make the right trade-offs. Think about scalers, for instance. Generally, you have, you know, the data, type, data types that you have in other programming languages are richer than the one in Perl. And typically, you have strings, and you have floats, and integers, booleans, whatever. OK. How brave is that? I mean, the reflection, the, 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 you know, the decision to say, you know what, for the kind of problems that I want Bell to solve, I believe most of the times it doesn't matter. How, how brave is that? I mean, I, I believe it's, it's, a master, it's a masterful trade off. Another thing I, I noticed in Impel which I try to express this way. It is okay to break symmetry. And by this I mean, in Perl you have like several levels of abstraction. That's, that's the way it is designed, okay? You have different levels of abstraction. In other languages, you have like an a priori formal framework of some sort. And then when you have to program, you have to adapt your problem to that, to that framework. And I believe, I have the feeling that Bell goes the other way around. I mean, it's so flexible, it's so powerful that what, what you feel is that you get a problem and you can bend Bell to fit the problem. Look at this man. And now look at this. How ugly is that? Fuck that, man. This one, this, this is the good one. Context. Um, context for me is, 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 is brilliant. Um, with the idea of context, um, somehow you get just for free another, it's, it's like having a, a, a second dimension in, in, in your program, okay? So, so to speak, normally you have a, when you have a listing, that listing is kind of flat. But with context, all of a sudden, and with no cost, because it's, everything is implicit, you get like a second dimension, you get double explosiveness, so to speak. It's fantastic, and it, it's like a magic trick, you don't see it, okay? It's there, it, you don't see it. Of course, it's deterministic, but it's there. Mm. Mm. Of course, here we, we are seeing uh, the, the linguistic inspiration behind Bell. And in general, uh, you have like different paradigms or different inspirations for people doing or designing programming languages. Like, there are, there are Haskell with category theory, that you have lambda calculus, you have a series, you know, of formal things behind, or formal, or in the case of Pell, maybe it's not that formal, you know? Uh, some th guidelines that, that, that are behind design of the, of the, of the programming languages. But, um, I am not impressed by that. I mean, intellectually, it's interesting to know about category theory, about something, you know? But for me, the ultimate test is show me the code. Show me the code, which is the result of this, you know, this uh, substrat. And the, the Pell code clicks me. I mean, this is, linguistics is the, you know, the inspiration. But the result of the inspiration, I love it. For instance, sometimes you see, in my mind, na naive uh, presentations of functional programming. They say, for instance, uh, look, in mathematics, functions do not have side effects. 
that you get presented functional programming with that, with that, with, with that, you know, with that first observation. And the, the, you know, the, the implied assumption is that that's wrong. That the implied assumption is that if in mathematics functions are in a different way, they should be that way in programming. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. Uh, I, I have never seen a, 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 math, a, you know, a math professor like, you know, saying that it's a, a heresy or something when they, do, when they see a, fun, a C function or something like that, okay? So, so uh, it's perfectly uh, reasonable to have a definition for function in mathematics, which indeed does not, in, you know, in the foundations in set theory, does not imply a sense of procedure, because a function formally is just a set of pairs. So there's, there's, no, there's no computation. It's just the map from, you know, from the domain to the image. And, uh, well, that, that definition does not, it, it, programming language have a different definition. It's fine. There's no, there's no conflict there, okay? The conflict may be in how do you use that. Also, I love the, the word context. I love it. I mean, it's kind of an assuming, don't you think? So it, this could be called uh, multivariate foobar functor or something, okay? It's not called it that way. It's called it context. It's, it's a very, you know, it's the power, the power of good naming. Because when, when you are learning Perl, you see context, you say, okay, I am a person. I know what context is. And Pell is telling you, you know that, you are all set. And it's like, it's, Pell, it gets all, out of the way. It gives you that name, it clicks automatically in you, gets out of the way. In a sense, I believe Pell is at your service. Design for the common case. This is something that I believe it's also in the, in the way Pell modules and Pell programs in general and the language itself is designed. So you often see, given a problem that has common cases and edge cases, you often see people looking at all the spectrum and generalizing everything so that the, the solution, uh, you know, encompasses everything. So it gives you like a generalization where everything, all the cases are uniform, so to speak. And the generalization does not reflect the different weights of the different use cases. But in Pell, you, you, you don't do it. Uh, that way. So the common case, normally it's easy. It has a convenience layer, something, you know? Maybe you had like a, a, a full design behind, but there's a convenience layer that makes the common case easy for you. This one is key. I see it all over the place. Client code first. It's like usage first. So. <clears throat> In the Perl culture, you guys always think, I believe my interpretation of what, of my, my experience in those, in those years was the, the client code is first, is first. In the case of, of a module, that's the client code of the module. In the case of the language, the, the, the program, the, pro, the program themselves, all right? Uh, by that, I mean that you focus your design on how are going how are people going to use that? In the language itself, think about it. Think about the many ways you have to, to write string literals, for instance. Think about auto-quoting for hashes. There are many, many little details that, I mean, someone had to sit in a chair and write a parser for that, okay? But it's there. Is there why? Because the client code is going to be much better. Have you seen those 
uh, you know, strings with double quotes with many backslashes and concatenations in other programming languages. Not here, not here. There's another aspect of this that I'm going to comment on uh, later. And this is, a, this is a, a metaphor I like that kind of summarizes some of the points that I, I said, which is think with your editor, not with a blackboard or a white sheet of paper. Think with your editor, how is the code going to look like? Okay, so 2000, the world is no longer disconnected. There was Usenet, I miss Usenet a lot. Usenet was amazing. I got on a screenshot from 96. And you can see there Randall, you can see Mark Jason Dominus there, and, and a, a, bunch, a bunch of people. I mean, how, how big is that? I mean, you pass from, from, from an epoch in humanity where everything is local. You go to the university and your models are your professor. You go to a library and you got so, some, so, some books, but you do not have Amazon to buy the best book in the world. You do not have. Here, we have the best people in the world sharing knowledge with you through the internet. How big is that? I, I honestly believe uh, this, this is going to level up humanity, you know, in global, because kids nowadays can have as references, as models, the best people in the world. That's going, I, mean, I, I believe that's going to, to be a big change in humanity. IRC. Uh, I was like in IRC for two, three years maybe in Freenode uh, as a regular. Uh, there are many ways to help in an open source project. When people ask, how could I start doing open source? How could I help in this or that other project? Uh, sometimes the question implies that they want to contribute patches. But open source projects are uh, much bigger than that. And there are many ways to help in an open source project. One of them is to, to help people, in this case, in IRC. IRC uh, develops in you in a spider sense. Because in IRC, you know, the bandwidth is very, is very small. It's text and it's, you know, quickly typed. First thing you have to gauge somehow is how much does the person know? Because to, to a channel, yeah, in a channel, there are many, many possible, you know, profiles of people coming from, uh, for help. There's the experienced guy that never did network programming, but there's the, you know, the, the, the guy that is learning. Uh, there are many, many, many different people. And from some sentence, according to the way they express themselves, according to the way they have expressed the problem they have, you have to have an intuition about which more or less is the level of, of that person. That's something that you develop with time, I believe. And it's very important because if you are in a help channel, uh, I believe you have to make uh, an effort to, be, to try to communicate uh, the best way you can for the, for the people you are helping. For instance, if, if someone comes asking how to do uh, case insensitive uh, uh, regular, uh, uh, regular expression matches, the question itself is telling you that this guy is more or less new to this thing. Okay, so one, one uh, canonical answer for this in the channel was per doppel rep. Man, th the question is telling you that this guy is not able to digest per doppel rep. He's not at least in my opinion, is not a good answer. It's not, it's not helping that guy. You have, you have to, to, you know, to tune 
your vocabulary and to tune the, the amount of information or references you give according to, to your, what your intuition says about the person. You got also x, y questions. These are very interesting. It's, it's, it's a situation where someone uh, asks how to do x, but in reality, what they want is to solve y. Okay? And due to the way they are, they are going around the problem of x, you start to, sus to suspect that they are going after some different thing. And often, often, to solve y, if you know Bell well, the solution is not x, but something else. It's interesting to, uh, to develop an intuition also for these questions. And I believe this, is, this was my, my, the, the, the main thing I learned in IRC. For me, it's, it's the best debugging school. It's the best debugging school because, because uh, you get someone with a problem, you know, describe it in text uh, very shortly. And in IRC, you have to try with as little questions as possible to detect what's happening and solve it. Okay? If you do that for three years, man, uh, that's, a, that's an incredible debugging school. And I would like to leverage this moment to have uh, a little tribute to Ian Trusquet. He was a spoon in, in Freenode, a spoon with capital S. And he passed away when, when I was a regular there. He wrote just before passing away uh, Bell Re Ref, which, is, which has been all these years my cheat sheet for, for um, uh, checking stuff about regular expressions. Okay, documentation. In my experience, the Perl community has the highest documentation standards I've, I've, I've found. It's incredible. I mean, the, the amount and quality of documentation being an open source project is just amazing. And even more if you uh, go to Ruby, because in Ruby, Culturally, I mean, maybe historically, the, you know, Ruby is a Japanese language, or comes from Japan, and... <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe historically, there was a language barrier, because, because uh, the, 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 the Japanese committers are not very fluent in English, and then producing documentation is difficult. But uh, nowadays, that's no longer the case. I mean, the commuters are still mostly Japanese, but there are many people, you know, in the, open source, in the Ruby open source community. It could be fixed by the community, but it's not. It's not. I mean, if you, if you, if you, uh, we have Pell.pel. I mean, this, this, is, this is huge. This is huge, man. And when I followed with uh, uh, P5 Porters, you saw a patch with code and the, and the corresponding documentation. That was like the rule. Um, but in Ruby, that's not the case. That's not the case. And uh, indeed, if you want to learn the language, you have to buy a book. There's, there's no, you know, there's no, uh, in, there's no good documentation uh, about Ruby at all. And that's interesting because. It's like I, I, I went to a different community and I, I realized how many things are cultural. I didn't, I didn't realize that until I was out. How many things are social? Okay? In Ruby, people do not document in general. It's not the same level of commitment that you have in the Pell community. They just don't do it. And many people think you should go and read the source code. They, they, they truly believe it. Okay? It's a, I'm not saying it is, it is better or worse. I personally prefer uh, the, the Perl way, okay? But indeed, GitHub changed that a little bit. Why? I believe just because in GitHub, your, the home page of your project uh, was the public face, and you are supposed to put a readme there. 
So before GitHub, that was 2008, if I remember correctly, before GitHub, Ruby gems didn't even have a fucking readme. I, but how, how, how the hell I use this thing? Oh, read the source code, man, no. And with, with GitHub, at least readme's well, uh, a little bit better, but still, still way to go. And that's something cultural. I mean, it's like a cluster, okay? For some reasons, that it, it does not clusterify there. I don't know, for some reasons. And that, you, you get that inertia because that what, that's what you see okay, in, in your community and that's what people do. So there's uh, a good, um, um, I believe there's a, there's a good social component on, on, those, on these things. Uh, modules and something that for me it's brilliant. I mean, I, I don't know who had this idea, but for me it's, it's one of, I don't know, the, 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 maybe the thing that I love the most in, in, in the Pell standards, which is the synopsis. It's, I don't know, it's amazing the synopsis. <laughs> what a simple thing, but, but to me it communicates a lot of things. Because you go to, to the documentation of something and you get, the first thing you see is this thing. How do you use it? Again, the same thing. How do you use it? In Java, at least when I did Java, most of the time the documentation explained how is this designed. <laughs> and when I switched it to Pell, I saw this. Wow, this is so big. It doesn't need to be consistent, it doesn't need to be a complete program, you know. It's just snippets of code that, that, that say, you, this is used this way, and you are, you are set. Then you have the complete reference below, okay? But the synopsis is big. I, I have not seen something like synopsis in, in, in any other place. And for me, that's, that's a signal of another of the, I believe, most important trademarks of a seasoned developer, which is empathy. Because client code first, all these things, documentation, the synopsis, to me, they mean the people behind this have empathy towards the users of the software. Very difficult to find. And you guys have this culturally. To me, it's amazing. Uh, I believe that documentation is so important in Pell and, in so, and so important personally for me in any uh, software project, at least in open source, you know, that uh, in those of nice, in those of nice uh, loops in, in life, I, so I studied math, then I went to work in, in, in software, and in two or three years, I was asked, I was invited by the same faculty to teach Pell in the faculty. It was amazing. I did it for seven years. I taught Pell seven years in the University of Barcelona. It was in my spare time. It was something vocational uh, because, okay, because that cont contributes to the new generations and I don't know, I love it. Well, the point is, the first classes, so, the students, the students in this class were third year, third year students, okay? So they already knew what's a while loop. Okay, so to me, documentation, it's so important and so uh, in the core of the Pell culture that the first classes were about documentation. So before seeing any Pell code, they knew Pell log, Pell log min, uh, minus F, you know, the, the FAQ, they knew everything. And the first exercises were exercises about solving questions with the documentation without knowing Pell. You know, how do you, how do you compute the length of an array in, play, in Pell? Go, go find yourself in the documentation, okay? This is something I learned 
also in the PAL community, testing. I mean, the commitment to testing is so strong in the PAL community, or at least it was when I was, when I was in there. I guess <laughs> it's still there. <laughs> so it was so amazing. Uh, when I switched to Ruby, indeed, some people in Ruby that were too young, maybe, kind of believed that Ruby were the ones that invented testing because they were very strong. You know, men. Well, coming from Pell, that was like like years. Like, it's so it's so so ingrained, you know, in the culture. Um, in general, test uh, things were test when you installed a module. The, the test suite ran into fucking in, in your fucking machine. You know, it's not that, that the it's not even that the there was the, let's say the discipline to write a suite and the developer was supposed to check the suite when he uploaded the module to, to, to CPAN. And it, it, it ran in your machine. And then you had CPAN test testers, which is so huge. I mean, the, it's, it's uh, how do you say it in English? Priceless CPAN, CPAN testers. So amazing, so many platforms, so many, so many variations of, of, of Pell. So if you knew that your suite was green in all, in, in all those things, you were slept very well at night, you know? And the most important thing was when, when, when you had like 13 greens and one red in that particular thing, that particular architecture or something like that. And yet, then thanks to Zipan testers, you could be able to detect a bug that you couldn't have known about otherwise. CPAN. What to say about CPAN? When people refer to CPAN uh, as one of you know, the big things in Pell, normally they refer to the amount of modules that you find there. And that's true. But for me at least, CPAN means much more than that. Much more than a collection of modules. Because once I saw it from outside, CPAN is like a big social thing in Pell. Why? Because, for instance, if you want to contribute something, a, a module, the path is already clear. You, ha you know what, what, you, what do you have to do. You have to uh, go to pause, whatever, you know, it's clear, it's, it's clear what to do. Then, how is, which are, which are the standards for the module? Since everything is in CPAN, uh, I believe uh, that, has, uh, that has allowed, you know, this kind of, 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 of culture to crystallize there. So, since before you want to publish something, normally you have been a Pell developer for some time, you already have like a uniformity in what is expected from your module. So you know that if you want to contribute and be a CPAN citizen, you have to document things the way you have seen it. And you have to test things the way you have seen they run when you install your modules. So. So it's not only for me the, the, you know, the collection of modules that you have there contributed by the community. It's much more than that. It's, it's all the social implications that CIPAN means. And the last thing, and one of the, one of the, the ones that I mostly love about, about the Pell community is this crazy creativity you guys have. I, I, I have not found this level of craziness anywhere else. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, there's some C obfuscation contest, there's some stuff. But at this level, man, no. So the, the Acme name, name space, that's so hilarious and so, so brilliant. I don't know. It's, it's amazing. Javs, you know, Pell Golf. Pell Golf, it's amazing. I played Pell Golf for some time when, when Brian Defoy uh, edited the, the Pell Review. There were some tournaments that, that lasted some days. And 
dude. That that was that was so big. So in in those tournaments, uh, uh, everybody everybody knows what spell golf, right? Okay, fine. Okay. So in those tournaments, you had the leaderboard, which was public. So the situation was that you have you you had to squeeze your mind to get those seventy four characters, you had that brilliant solution, you submitted it to the contest, went to the leaderboard, like proud, and you see that motherfucker that had, I don't know, 67 or something like that. What how, how good, I mean, my solution is, is so squeezed, I have no fucking idea how that guy is seven charts, uh, you know, uh, in a, with a solution seven charts uh, smaller than mine. No idea, it was amazing. I, I, I was lucky to be a referee in a, in a couple of three of them, I don't know. Uh, being a referee, it's being in, in behind the scenes, and that's, you know, amazing squared. It was fantastic, because if you are a referee, you are, you are receiving the, the, you know, the submissions of the people playing. And that's an amazing experience, because you see that that guy has discovered this technique. And this, this one is having a different approach. And then there's another guy that is going more or less in the same path that that guy. You see all this evolution for days. And you see that this, this guy had like a very clever trick that reduced something. And you smell that that one is about to discover that trick. Amazing. It was amazing. It was so addictive I had to quit because it was interfering in my life. I mean. <laughs> I couldn't work, it was, I was driving and thinking about how to shorten something. <laughs> I had to quit. Playing pel golf needs mastery of the language and, and mastery to know every single corner of the language to be competitive. You have to, and, and you have to go beyond that. You, you know, it, it needs some lateral thinking because normally the competitive solutions use things in a way that they are not intended to be used uh, for. And to make, to make an example, I will show you something that is not golf, but it's in the spirit, in the spirit of lateral thinking uh, in a genius way, which is this one-liner everyone knows by Abigail, okay? This thing is just so genius, man. And I, I have to tell you something. To my surprise, outside the Pell community, many people do not understand these things. I, I, I cannot process that. I don't know how, that, how is that possible. For instance, a lot of prejudices about Pell golf. Hmm, you should be thinking about read ball code, man. Uh, that's, not, that's, not, that's not the point. The, this this one-liner was in Hacker News, maybe, I don't know, some months ago. Someone reposted it or something. There were commenters in Hacker News saying, but this is not an efficient way to compute. <laughs> <laughs> Man, what are you talking about? I mean, this is genius. I mean, you should recognize. You, I mean, you, you, any, anyone presented with this should be, wow, wow, even if he doesn't know Pell, you know? It's so amazing. Uh, indeed, uh, I, I, I love this, this, this one-liner so much that um, in a, you know, maybe a couple of years ago or three, I wanted to explore this technique, the, the technique to represent the number of, uh, as a string of ones and then dividing, okay? Because uh, this, you know, this one-liner finds, uh, or tries to find, a, a, how to pronounce it, divisor? Divisor? Makes sense? Okay, divisor tries to find a, a divisor of the number, but it does it does it in a in a way that if you think about it, if it finds one, it finds a prime. And in addition to that, let let's visualize every, everyone. Let's visualize, for instance, fifteen ones, a string with fifteen ones. Okay, and you find that blocks of three go evenly, can be distributed evenly, blocks of three. Okay, that visualization is division. 
And that's what's behind this, this one liner. And we can go, we, we, we can make another observation. If you visualize the groups of three and collapse every group of three with a one, that's a quotient. That's the quotient of the, divi of, of the division. You know, we are thinking, that's, la that's the lateral thinking. We are thinking uh, a problem that would make you in a numerical mindset, typically, using a string operations. <coughs> and putting those uh, observations together, you get a prime fact factorization. So doing a substitution here, uh, you are dividing effectively, so that's prime factorization. And I wanted to explore this more, so I, uh, I wrote one-liners for the, all these things, comprimability number of the visor, fraction reduction, Euler's fee, square free test, and a bunch of other things, and I had to quit, I had to stop, because <laughs> this is the repo if anyone has curiosity. So I bow before this one-liner. Pearl poetry, we saw yesterday Black Pearl, uh, act, active state made a haiku contest, Pearl haiku contest, I believe it was 2004 or something like that. This was the winner. No less can I say, require strict close attention while you write haiku. I submit a couple of, of entries to this contest. One of them uh, actually won the second prize. But I would like to show you the one that didn't win. Heart, sigils flowing, power magic for fun, push yourself farther. This is what Pell meant to me, and this is what Pell means to me. So to Larry and to the Pell community, thank you very much. Okay, oi, it's an honor for me. Appreciate it. Likewise. And uh, maybe we'll get you back with Pearl Six. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Larry. Thank you very much. <laughs>